when you consider what these awkward, these awkward things called relationships are, they're the things, they're how we become people. We become people through them. And they're inherently messy. They're inherently uncomfortable. If you think about all the, all the possible things that could happen by you and I just engaging in a conversation, you could say something to me that I misunderstood that could hurt me so bad that I need therapy for 10 years, right? Or you could say something to me that could enlighten me, right? There's this, there's this range of possibilities that could happen in any interaction. And so that's inherently scary. So if you make it optional, mm -hmm. right, our nervous systems are just going to do the easier thing, right? And I, th I think we see that all over the place. Before we move into it, I want to express some gratitude. I want to thank all of you for hanging in. I want to thank the fantastic crew for all the work they've done, the work of people behind the scenes, KC and Chris. I want to thank all three of you who contributed in irreplaceable ways to the content and the flow and the exemplification of the series. I want to thank you all. The series is, uh, it's been daunting throughout and I've relied upon the support that all of you have provided in multiple ways. So I just wanted to express my, th my thanks. So we're going to move into something following up for where we really try to unfold what dialectic into dialogos is the reverse engineering of something like how we could be Socrates to each other. And that sits within the longer arc of what the Socratic way is, how it relates to the Kierkegaardian and Christian way, how it relates <clears throat> to Buber's way. And I want to take all of that and turn it towards this question, which I, which I want to share with these, these three friends, which is the general observation that There's a family of things that are like dialectic and ideologos, and there's a family of things that overlap with it. There's authentic relating and there's circling, right? And there's, uh, there's things like empathy circling, uh, with Edwin Roy and there's the Buddhist insight dialogue. And there's the amazing work that Thomas Stottinger is doing in Germany, uh, and, 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 and so many more, I, I, I don't want to try and list everybody cause I'll leave somebody out. And if it was look, look, looking like I was trying to be exhausted, then someone would be, would be offended. So I'm just going to leave it at that. So the question is why this, why now, why this, why now? And of course, if you happen to connect it to this thing called the meaning crisis, that would be wonderful. <laughs> but why this, why now? And I won't, I don't want to speak to the question first. I want to propose it and hear what you all have to say, whatever would like to go first. Given that we've just had this rich, not even taste, this rich drinking of what the logos, dialectic into the logos is. Why this, why now? Well, I would say this is not exhaustive, but I think it is, I want to see if I can distinguish that we're in a time in history where something's happened with relationship and communication, primarily due to the internet that has never happened before. Mm -hmm. If we want to, if you look at it like this, like before texting and emailing and answering with answering machines, before all that, 
if you had to have exchange of information, you had to you had to at least talk on the phone. You had to uh, you had to do it through relationship. Now there was you know television and radio where there was a one way communication receiving of it, but it, the exchange of information always involved relationality, and because of that, to function required out of necessity so much re relationality just by virtue of functioning. I think that the, I think the first sign of this, where it was used like this, right, was relationship and communication got uncoupled with the answering machine was mm -hmm. the first time. Mm -hmm. And then, then it went into email and then texting and then social media and TikTok and the multiple array of things such that we're actually at a time where it's starting to occur for like, say, the Gen X tradition, like the Gen Xers, or not Xers, uh, is it Z? Gener yeah, gen showing my age. Um, <laughs> <laughs> who have, don't have a memory before, before synchronistic communication, right, was, it, was optional, right? They're the, they don't even have a memory for that. Therefore, they don't even have it as it's it's almost like relationship on some level occurs as this unnecessary thing mm -hmm. right that i even I, I just happened to go on youtube and there was a i saw a thing where it was a streamer the guy who just streamed just playing games and talks on youtube all day talked about his sex life and he's like, why would I actually go out and have a real sex? That would mean I have to go out of my apartment and I'd have to go down and talk to people and go to the bar and then maybe meet somebody and bring them back. And then I have to take my clothes off. And it's like, I could just go to this Discord server and I've already broken my computer, computer pers pers persona sex, right? I'm, I'm de-virginized there already. Why would I do all of that? So I think, and then, and then if you also think about it, where we're also in a time where all you need is an internet connection, right? A computer. And like you could literally have a ton of connections. No, mil, no millions of people. Start a company, become world famous, make, become a billionaire. And you could do it without ever having to have an actual interaction. We're in a time where that's possible. So whenever you uncouple anything from anything else, the same thing happened with the Industrial Revolution, Revolution where it uncoupled, like machines brought the world right in front of us. So it uncoupled functioning from movement. Boom, you uncouple those things. And then we have this that transformed our relationship to our body. I, I think something at a at a basic level like that is happening with relationship. Now, when you do that with this, when you consider what these awkward, these awkward things called relationships are, they're the things, they're how we become people. We become people through them. And they're inherently messy. They're inherently uncomfortable. If you think about all the all the possible things that could happen by you and I just engaging in a conversation. You could say something to me that I misunderstood that mm -hmm. could hurt me so bad that I need therapy for 10 years, right? Or you could say something to me that could enlighten me, right? There's this, there's this range of possibilities that could happen in any interaction. And so that's inherently scary. So if you make it optional, mm -hmm. right, our nervous systems are just going to do the easier thing, right? And I, th I think we see that all over the place. So I don't think it's an, I don't think that's the whole reason, right? Why dialectic into dialogos and, and everything that we're doing here. I don't think it's, it's the, it's the whole reason, but I think it's a big, it's a big reason why it's speaking to us, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because there's an intuition that we have that something is missing. And what's interesting is I just saw, I just saw a, um, a series of papers come out about the epidemic of loneliness. Mm -hmm. And what's really interesting about the particular kind of loneliness that people are experiencing is 
It's a loneliness that they experience, but it's not a driver to go out mm -hmm. in the relationship. It has them go further into isolation, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Which is really striking to me. Mm -hmm. You would think, lo well, you're lonely, so you want to be around people. So like you'd mm -hmm. be moved to do that, but you're lonely, but it's a kind of loneliness that actually does not presuppose to you to be driven to be around people. And so I think that there's a there's a there's there's a pathology going on an underdevelopment going on with us that we only get through interaction and relationship that is become optional um and so i think that's a big part of it that's one proposal i'll make around it oh that's really good yeah i think that's a big chunk that's a big piece. Might not be exhaustive, but it's somewhere very near to the heart of it, I think. It's, it's interesting, interesting that last point about how the loneliness does not incentivize company. And maybe one of the reasons for that is because in the absence of a manner of sociability that authenticates itself, that actually invites intimacy and disclosure in the way that we've been trying to exemplify. In the absence of that mode of engagement, company is, I think, a more severe form of loneliness than solitude, right? Because there's a normative contrast, there's a tension. When you're in company, you ought not to feel lonely, or so you think. The fact that you do when you do suggests that there's something wrong about reality itself. There's something wrong with you or about the nature of what's happening. Something is out of sorts, but whatever is out of sorts is reflecting itself back on you. It's your fault, or so it feels. And I think maybe that's why a lot of people I know this feeling. Like I know this feeling from experience. I think most of us probably do that if we're forced, if we're going to opt for one kind of loneliness or another, one kind of isolation for another, whether it's the isolation that comes in company mm. or the one that comes with solitude, I think the solitude seems far more appealing. And this idea that relationships have become very, very transactional. I think a lot of it has to do with it. It's as trite as it sounds. And it really does sound trite. But it, the, the loss of the meaning of friendship, philia, mm. I think has a lot to do with this as well, right? Even the term, it's so equivocal. What it refers to is so equivocal, right? It refers to every shade of acquaintance imaginable from the very remote to the very intimate. And I think that it's difficult to understand that as a necessity, as something you need to nourish your soul, as a place you find yourself, mm -hmm. as a place you find yourself, mm -hmm. not as something incidental, right? But something that is essential to you being able to uncover yourself and con make contact with yourself, right? We've spent so much of this, so much of our dialogues in the series, and you've mm -hmm. spent so much of your time talking about this alone, that we make contact with ourselves by finding deep, deep level of acquaintance in the experience of being known beyond what it is that we could have known about ourselves, mm -hmm. being touched in that sense, mm -hmm. right? And um, I don't even know if I could begin to speculate or enumerate the reasons why that is so scarce and in such short supply, that philia. Mm -hmm. A lot of, you know, a lot of people have made some very sophisticated arguments about it, I know. But whatever it is that has brought that about, that has depleted it, its depletion, I think, is a, is a big piece of this as well, right? Because of course, we'll be, of course we'll be thrown back into solitude if the only option is meaningless interaction. Mm -hmm. I have no desire for meaningless interaction, mm -hmm. right? 
I'd opt for solitude over that any day. And I think most people would. Right? If you're going to choose an inward form of scarcity or a social form of scarcity, one, I think, is often a little bit more repellent than the other because it suggests that there's something wrong with you and something wrong about the way that the world is fitting together in the first place. Mm-hmm. And I think it's that that, that, is the, that quakes us sometimes. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it occurs to me there's something about you know, this transition or this new oncoming you know, Gen Z, but also previous generations spending more and more time online. So maybe for Gen Z, there's a, a never knowing of what's possible. And then for the older ones, you know, getting Gen Y and into the Gen X and millennials, there's a forgetting as well, like a forgetting of what that was like. Like maybe you had that when you grew up, but you know, the way that, you know, that happens is you go through school and you, you build a life, you sort of distance yourself. And then as the technology comes in, it creates a, a wider gap. So it occurs to me that the meaningless conversations are probably happening because there is forgetting or there is a never knowing of what's possible and therefore when people are coming together they're not making contact Mm -hmm. they're talking past each other or they're doing you know perhaps even worse sort of engaging in more of a you know the religion of politics you know they're you know the culture war sort of you know and that's the engagement and then it's just like i don't want that so it makes perfect sense you know of why there would be that step back into solitude yeah yeah i i I think the 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 way in which the emergence of social media obviously there's a there's a quantitative aspect that we've been talking about but there's a qualitative aspect too that i think is really important which is Right. The idea, we have an idea of communing underneath communication as common union, as a process of continuing. We are the, we are the primates that have the longest childhood and we have to go through cultural maturation, at, which is as significant as our biological maturation. And that that process, and the idea that that process like nobody ever says, well, I'm mature enough. I'm done. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and in fact, um, maturation is ongoing <clears throat> and it's interesting. John Rusin talks about maturation as, you know, and notice the language we use. It's, it's a capacity to face or to face up to reality. And it's the facing, right. Which is a, an interpersonal thing. And that maturation is a process you catch agopically from other people. Right. And, and so we have lost the person making maturation function of communing because we have put such an emphasis on the quantity of information and how rapidly we can transmit it to each other. And so this has been a big refocusing of what the point of communication is. The point of communication is this pointless, how much information is being moved around such that the movement of the information can make different people wealthy or powerful. And that has lost out to, well, under, you know, it's the, the, the T.S. Eliot, where, where's the wisdom we've lost in the knowledge and where's the lo- knowledge we've lost in the information, right? And so I think it's, no, I'm not disagreeing that it has had these practical effects. And, you know, I try to talk about this, about propositional tyranny, and a whole, but the idea is there's this fundamental notion that we have lost, we have lost the, like the maturation per, per, person making functions mm-hmm. of, and, and we've lost layers of that. We had friendship. We still have friendship, although the number of true friends that people has, has been regularly declining, but we've completely lost the category of fellowship, which was a much more comprehensive. Yeah. Mm-hmm. co-commitment mm-hmm. Uh, to person making. Mm-hmm. And so I, I think there's this, there's this overall move towards the, 
there's this overall move towards this diminished. So you can see a, a, a parallel thing in, in which, like we talk about the horizontal and the vertical, right? And, and how they feed into each other. We've lost the contemplative sense of ratio as coming into right relationship with that which transcends us and coming into right relationship with that which grounds us. Mm-hmm. And then we reduced it in Descartes. Ruchet's book about how Descartes hated logos and he proposed logic in its stead, right? And we, and we reduced the contemplative to the computational. And then we're now witnessing that the computational isn't even for what it was for Descartes, trying to get the truth. The computational is now just the quantification of how much communication, and that's the only standard, it's the only number. So we've got this concomitant, right, reduction of ratio. We've got, right, a maturation of person making. And I think it means for us that we are losing ourselves as anything other than instrumental in nature. Mm-hmm. Cool. So when, when you get, when you lose communing and when you lose contemplative ratio, you, you lose the sake of ratio for its own sake mm-hmm. or personhood for its own sake. If rationality becomes merely instrumental, of communication becomes merely instrumental. And we are the creatures of ratio communication. We are the creatures of logos. Then we ultimately become merely instrumental. Mm. And I think that is a fundamental undermining of our capacity to be the intrinsically, inherently valuable and meaningful things that persons are. And I think that is fundamentally what like what's driving this in a really profound way we are losing we are losing not in some technical academic sense where we can give propositional definitions but we are losing the existential deciding for oneself of being a person and the phenomenology Mm -hmm. of what that is Mm -hmm. in a deep and profound way Mm -hmm. we're itting ourselves yes we are we we are losing the thou in possibility and this is Mm -hmm. in that vertical and horizontal dimension is precisely what comes together in dialogos yes yes right yes precisely what comes together in dialogos yes Mm -hmm. right the communing the the philia the friendship the transcendence right all of it comes together and to me when all of that comes together in a relational context Right, that's nothing less than the profoundly sacred. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes. participating in the sacred. Mm-hmm. And here's the other part, where in in some sense we've also lost, um, where religion and religious belief is becoming less and less viable for people. Yes, and that has been the for the the holder for fellowship for yes, thousands yeah. and thousands of years. And so we're in a time in history where where that's declining right in participation more and more rapidly and cultural importance yes Mm -hmm. yes Mm -hmm. and so in some sense we are i i believe what what's happening in circling ultimately why people come in and participate in circling is to participate in the sacred whether or not they call it that or not yes it's to it's to encounter to dwell in to find themselves in the midst of encountering the sacred Mm -hmm. and and that seems to, oh, it's like a rip in the universe that opens up that glows to them, right? That they can't, that when they experience it, it's not like they were looking for it. No. It's not like they knew to look for yeah, it or yeah, something. Yeah. Yeah. But when they found it, they realized that's all they had been looking for. Yes. Right? Mm-hmm. In some sense. Mm-hmm. Well, how frequently, like people in, like, for example, when we do the workshops, how people largely from secular or at least from the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, that they start to talk about what's happening using religious, mm-hmm. right? And spiritual terminology. And, and then how often they also pronounce, as you just said, this, 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 this discovery of an intimacy they did not know they exist, but they always longed for. And the two are interwoven together. Like we keep seeing that again and again and again. But I think the two, those two things, well, those three things, the, the 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 the, dec- the decline in communication, and then what I was trying to articulate in, in the disappearance of the possibility of personhood, mm-hmm. and then 
and and then the decline of ratio and the loss of religion. I think I think those are all they they're all they're not separate phenomena. They are all interpenetrating and accelerating each other. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. There's something I'm noticing in, in, in all of this, which is that there's a theme of memory. Mm. Um like in an anamnesia sense. Maybe so. Um let's maybe let's let's feel that out a little bit. Like yeah. Because you talk about this idea of having lost something, not lost something in the technical sense, but it's more like having forgotten. You used it yeah, in those, yeah. you put it in those terms too, Taylor. This mm, idea yeah. that that we've been inattentive attentive to the wrong things, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. A relevance mm -hmm. realization problem, you yeah, would yeah, say, yeah. right? It's like we've lost the wrong details have become important. Mm -hmm. And I think about this as a this is really a verbal, this is an oral. This is an oral practice. It's an embodied, it's not just oral, it's embodied yeah. and it's recorded and whatnot. I often wonder about that. I often wonder about, I mean, we're, we're doing it right now. So, you know, this, this, I'm calling into question the very thing that we're doing. I guess that's appropriately enough, appropriate enough though. I wonder sometimes about the value of recording something whose, whose import has to be understood existentially in the moment in an embodied sense when it is embedded in a particular context and implicature. I was having a conversation with a friend recently where we were both sharing, um, you know, instances of falling out with someone, memories of falling out with someone, where you have, uh, you know, we've been talking so much about about conversations that are edifying and transformative in a positive sense. But, you know, I'm sure we've all had instances of the opposite, where you have a conversation with someone that ruptures a relationship, and that relationship rupturing ruptures you. Mm -hmm. And you carry that rupture from that point on. It's there, right? And it could be any kind. It could be a romantic relationship. It could be a close friendship. It could be a family member. The point is that we were talking about the process of trying to come to grips with an experience like that and what tends to happen in the immediate aftermath of a fallout, especially if it happens in a conversation. I mean, inevitably it does, right? And the way that memory and your particular encounter with memory has a lot to do with how the experience integrates, folds back into you, and becomes an affordance for change and transformation. And one of the things we were talking about is the difference between attending to the memory of that relationship and its fallout at the level of microscopic detail, right? What I said, then what she said, then what he said, then what I said, then what we did, then what happened, right? You know how when you have this falling out, the thing you do is you replay the conversation at the minutest level of detail. And each time you do it, you find a different detail around which the whole thing could have turned. Mm -hmm. But if I had just said that differently, it all could have been different. Or if I had just remembered that one detail, right? That could have been the Kairos. The whole thing could have turned around that one thing I said wrong or that one moment I stalled or that one thing I fanned on. And then I think as time goes on, you begin to realize consciously or not that the way that, that there is a truer form of memory. There's a way that you can remember that that is actually more real, less factual, but more real. And I think this is where the anamnesis comes in a little bit, right? Especially when we understand the reconstructive nature of memory and that memory is a creative act in as much as it is anything else. Memory is about the future. Right. Yeah. And so... One of the things that occurred to me, occurred to both of us when we were having this conversation is that it seems important to be able to overcome and work through a sort of a traumatic, I hate to use that word, but a very, a very injurious fallout with somebody is to reset the level of resolution on the memory where you're not remembering the finest details, the things that were said, because they're going to get refracted anyway but you're remembering something more impressionistic, something more essential to the character of what happened between you. 
The truth of the relationship doesn't lie in the recorded details. The truth of the relationship lies somewhere in the creative act of revisioning that relationship in such a way that it takes a place inside of your soul, if I can put it in those terms. What it, does it mean? What is its signification, right? That kind of memory, that more creative, poetic form of memory that can't be arbitrary, but also can't be tethered to those fine details because you won't find it there. You won't find the church in the stone quarry, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Even if it's built out of that stone. One thing that we have now with social media, which is trying to bring this back now, why am I talking about memory? Is that, you know, everything we say in that medium is recorded. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things that are recorded, the vast majority of which are irrelevant. We make a big show of throwing out our propositions when we do dialogos for a good reason, because the propositions themselves don't adhere to us and don't adhere to the process. They're instrumental, they pass through, and they're gone, and that's as it should be. They evaporate. They're supposed to. They're not the point. And I think this is, has a lot to do with the propositional tyranny that you often talk about. It's that our level of recorded memory, the kind of memory that we pay most fastidious attention to, is the narcissism of small details, mm -hmm. small differences. Small differences. Small differences, right? And when we pay attention at that level of resolution, we deprive ourselves of the creative capacity to remember in such a way that we participate in the artful creation of what is most meaningful mm. in such a way that we can discover it again. It's a loss of the poetic spirit. And I think that in the way that that can happen to an individual or between a couple of individuals when they have a falling out, I think in some sense that's happening perhaps to our relationships in general, right? We're just paying attention to the wrong things because we've misunderstood the nature of what it means to remember ourselves and remember one another mm -hmm. in such a way that we can play a role in its significance. You know, you used to, you, if, you're, if, you're going to, if you're going to tumble over a difficult topic, mm -hmm. there's a big difference between going to the pub having a few beers, tumbling over a difficult topic, and then having all of the propositions vanish at the end of the night. Because what you're left with, what you're left with is the resonance of the contact that you can use as the raw material to envision its meaning for the future. But if what you're left with is the letter of what was said, you will find fault and error and sin in every single word. And if that's what you attend to, that's what will be most real. And if that's what's most real, then we're all in a lot of trouble mm -hmm. and we're all implicated. Mm -hmm. What you just described is that you leave and all the prop propositions disappear, but you, you're left with, what did you say? The, the resonance. The resonance. And that resonance you carry with you into the next conversation. Mm -hmm. To me, this sounds like practice. Mm -hmm. To me, this is sounds starts to sound like practice. To me, this sounds like Plato and the Phaedrus when Socrates is worried about writing, destroying actual dialogos. And of course, the irony is we only know of this because of writing, mm -hmm. right? And so it, it's. I, I think I think what we I, I think maybe what we could say is we're facing a kairos because. I agree with everything Chris said, and of course, in some ways, I agree with what Socrates says there, but I also disagree with him because I'm in a performative contradiction if I completely agree with him, right? And, and so you see, you see I, I would argue in third way, Platonism argues, you see Plato trying with the dialogue format to try and bring beyond the propositions, the drama, the character, the effective setting time and place. And Plato's always, even within a dialogue, the Republic, he starts and then he starts again to let you know there's no absolute starting point, all the stuff that has been discussed in the series. So I put, I, I put it back to you, Chris, that what, have you, what you have described is the left hand of this, but there's the right hand that, but we could do better than the mere written text of the Platonic dialogue. We can even better mm -hmm. 
keep the recording of the drama of the character mm -hmm. right and and so that's what i'm trying to now put it i i what i'm getting from is the possibility and i i think this is almost like a kierkegaardian choice it's at least a formian choice right of a, of right we, we could do it we could we could be misdirected by this and and, and the way it's it, it's antagonistic to the creative the creativity within reconstructive memory we could be misdirected and enhance the propositional theory that's what i hear you saying the left hand but then i also want to say but we could write even we could we could do something even better i don't mean artistically but i mean we could do something even better in terms of memory than the platonic dialogues by the way we can record so much of the nonverbal, mm -hmm. so much of the embodied so much of the drama so much of the way character and context and timing is showing up and then so that's the, i think the right hand uh, just to use one of Jonathan Peugeot's ways of talking, that's the right hand of what we're being offered here right now. And so then I think the 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 issue might be it's not just I don't know if you intended this, Chris, but so it, but it's not just a, a reflection on why this, why now. I think what's coming out of this also is what is the choice before us now? Mm -hmm. What is the choice before us now? Because there is the possibility of the exacerbation. I think Chris made an eloquent case, case for it. And then I'm trying to say this is this has a perennial aspect to it um, that's in Plato and that we can in some say, sense offer the choice that Plato offered us. We could appropriate this medium, at least this one, um, in such a way that we could choose to go this way, mm -hmm. the platonic way, rather than the propositional tyrannic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of, uh, there's a, a line I always loved that Nick Mount said of good literature, good poetry specifically, which is that its job is to strive for its own extinction. Mm -hmm. And I agree with you. It's like what the, it seems to me that the choice that Plato made was to create a form of recorded dialogue a form of, rec of a form of record that could undermine itself yes <laughs> and in undermining itself could create from itself a process that people could participate in and symbolically work through and notice this dialogue right now we're in some sense we're talking about the impossibility of what we're doing as we're just as we're doing the very possibility but it's being expressed. That koanic, yes, parabolic nature precisely makes it not a dialogue because dialogue in the everyday sense of dialogue never yes. calls itself into question yes. as an entity yes. in service of something beyond itself, like what we are proposing here with yes. the logos. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes, absolutely. And we just spent the previous um, dialogos or dialectic into dialogos trying to propose around dialectic and we were struggling over that right we yes. were struggling over a process that is that is bidirectional right mm -hmm. that is moving away from itself as it moves toward mm -hmm. yeah. what it's after yeah mm -hmm. and i think that's what you're proposing in response to the problem i raised yes Yes. And, and so I, mm. I, and I'm thanking you for raising it to a notch because, and I don't think we should leave the first level behind the first level of what's the etiology, what's the causal mm -hmm. factors that are at work, making this happen. Mm -hmm. I think those are, I think those are relevant mm -hmm. and they should be integrated, but the second level, they should be integrated with the second level. The second level is yeah, but above and beyond that, above those historical factors, right there, 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 there's something much more perennially structural at work here that we need to properly address. That's what I heard you say. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, it occurs to me that the sort of the answer, the, the answer to what's, you know, what do we do now? Is it sort of that movement of recognizing, you know, where the salience landscaping of say social media has gotten us and maybe suggesting that it has us moving away from wisdom so what does it look like to move towards wisdom in terms yeah. of social media, in terms of technology, in terms of the platform, the medium, the practices? Mm -hmm. To me, that seems to be the direction. 
that we need to be yes. moving in and reinforcing and, you know, paying attention to the right things where we were paying attention to the wrong things. And, and there's, uh, uh, this is, yes, this is something just to, mm -hmm. like, this has been one of your themes that this, I mean, you once explained to me that circling emerged from out of how can I enact Heidegger and how can I enact Heidegger's critique mm -hmm. of modernity and technology mm -hmm. and the loss of the logos mm -hmm. and the forgetting of being. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think what you're proposing in, in consonant with that is how do we situate the, the choice isn't just the left and the right. It's like, how do, what do we do now? Mm -hmm. and, and part of it is properly seeing how this is part of that larger project, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm pointing yeah. to you because like you're an exemplar of trying to, yes. do, and I've been trying to do that through this whole series, right? How can we recapture the whole Socratic Platonic yes. and, and put it into practice in a way that address, allows that framework to come yes. to light yes. so that whole framework can critique yes. all of the modernity and the technology and the surveillance capitalism yes. and, and, and all of the problem and all the pseudo-religious stuff that's emerging, et cetera. I just, I just wanted to get that in before you said something, because I really yeah. wanted to point to how you have exemplified this. Right, right. And it's interesting because it is how all that started was a group of, of our friends started to have these interactions that something glowed mm -hmm. that was, that struck us as deep and significant and in deep and significant in a way that was a different kind of deep and significance from all the other deep and significant things that mm -hmm. we were doing at the time. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we just noticed it and then started following it. Right. And as he's talked about, started to reverse engineer what exactly mm -hmm. was happening, mm -hmm. but it was, it, it, the, the important thing to get about this is like, no one came up with something, right? No one kind of looked at something and then go, okay, how do we market this? And like, how yeah, do we make it yeah, yeah, something yeah. like that? No, it was, it was in the encounter with it mm -hmm. and being surprised by it. Mm -hmm. Something exceeded us. It was a surplus of something. Mm -hmm. this so was, there's a positive, sorry. Yeah, yeah. There's a positive reason for why now. The negative reasons we were articulating, yeah, yeah. but there's also the positive yes. reason that you just put your finger on as yeah, well. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So we're getting sort of three kinds of answers and I think they're all important. We're getting a historical answer mm -hmm. and then we're getting a, I'll just label it a perennial structural answer. And then we're also getting, but there's a positive phenomena yeah. that's also happening. Yes. That's also explaining why now. Yes. Yes. And I think it's precisely in some sense, if you want to bring in Heidegger around this, it's, I think the thing that ca caught us essentially is what Heidegger would call being, mm -hmm. right? And, and the being that's, that is forgotten mm -hmm. in, the, in the substance metaphysics that we're yes. all indoctrinated in yeah. that organizes our thinking and therefore conceals that. There's something about relationship and the dynamic of I-thou when that starts to unfold, mm -hmm. it it's a breaking free of this metaphysics in some way. And, and the thing that withdrawals in metaphysics like shows itself, mm -hmm. right? And you can't not, ever, it's like out of the corner of your eye and then it, it moves and you try to articulate it, but you can kind of just do the outlines of it. But, but there's something around that that there's a, that what's interesting around that is that, is it, is it draws communities around it, mm -hmm. right? It's like, it's like it's some, it's, it, it feels like they're the seeds of culture or something. Well, common unity. Yeah. But it's not a unity of we, of the one, like of a thing or even yes. a set of proposition. It, it's like, it's a common wanting. Yes. Right. Yes. Right. There's the wanting of being tutors you yes. in, the, in the wanting of with, with each other. Right. In some really hard to like articulate or, or turn into a, a method, but there's something, this is, well, this is at least the Neoplatonic claim. Yeah. Coming into communion with, you know, a fundamental wanting empowers you, tutors you, induces mm -hmm. you into better wanting yourself mm -hmm. and wanting with others. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I cut you off a minute ago. What? Yeah. You know, it just sort of occurred to me, you know, a few phrases were coming up. It was sort of you talking about that, that contact point sort of occurred to me as like the really real, like that's mm -hmm. how I sort of experience it of like, 
of sort of the not knowing, but then sort of the remembering and the engagement of it. And it's like, this is more real. Like this has more gravity. This has more substance. Yeah. You know, going back to yeah. sort of like a trust, like yeah. there's, there's something inherent where it's just like inside, it's like a yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. That. Yeah. That. And I think I get the sense that it's the thing that continues to sort of call us that when people have that experience, yeah. there is some form of remembering. Um, even if it's more of a evolutionary biological remembering, yeah. there's something about that, that we've lost. Yeah. And so coming into contact and in, in these particular ways in which we do. Yeah. Yeah. It seems to just flip that switch. And I think it's important, right? We can, we can talk about the, the, the <laughs> loss, the loss of organized religion or, or the, the, the way in which we've lost that, but there's also a way where in some sense, what that used to hold in some ways is wiggled free from the structures that, 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 mm -hmm. that held it before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think there's an opportunity there, mm -hmm. right? I don't think that that's just a mistake or something that just maybe went wrong, but there's an opportunity there that seems to be part of the movement of all this it's itself in some way, right? Because, because I think that the, it's like it, it become democratized in some, some well, way. Well, I was going to yeah. go in exactly that direction. We, we, with the rise of things like democracy and science, where we see the dynamic, like self-organizing power of distributed cognition and collective yeah. intelligence. Yes. And then what we have is powerful analogs in our technology, right? The internet and, and the interfacing of interfacing of computers so that we release the power of distributed computation. So we're, we we're getting, we're getting all these hints of this power and its capacity to grasp, optimally grip hyper objects, the aspects of reality that are inaccessible to our own individual cognition, mm -hmm. like evolution or global warming or the United States of America, mm -hmm. right. Or something like that. And so what I'm saying is I think what's what we have is we have the disclosure of the possibility of the power of the collective intelligence within distributed cognition to be educated so that it can more and more better coordinate the optimal gripping on aspects of reality that are unavailable to in, in individuals. And I think that has a sense of more real mm. and realness to it that was typically only held by the distributed cognition of the, of the ecclesia, where I don't just mean the church, I mean also the temple, the mosque, whatever, right? The, these were, these were, the, if you'll allow me, these were the cultural cognitive, distributed cognitive machines that allowed people to grok or, uh, right? Uh, aspects or dimensions of reality across generations, across space and time between the imaginal and the sensible and the imaginal and the, in the intelligible that individuals on their own could not do. And so what I'm saying is all of this has the, the present possibility of constellating together in a way in which the functionality that was previously held by religion doesn't have to be held by religion, but it still can be made available and functional in people. That's my attempt to articulate it, the yes. wiggling free. Yes. So there's a light side also yes. to all of this right. in its capacity. I don't know why I keep speaking on behalf of the light. I'm usually the dark guy, uh -huh. but right. There's a light side in all of this because if it's disclosed, yeah. because, because of the speed and the connectedness, we can now see possibilities that we, we could only realize when we were with, yes. where, when we were within religious fellowship. Yes. That's what, well, that's what I'm proposing to you. Yes. Mm -hmm. And also I, I, it, in, I may be off with this, but there's also something too with this where technology actually can be a place where a platform is created. Yes. Right such that, and we were talking about this, you brought this up earlier about what are these conversations for? Are they for us here talking? And you, you propose that no, like- No, these are cathedral, these are cathedral building. Mm -hmm. Right. You're building cathedrals. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes. 
I have such a reaction to you saying that, that it's <laughs> visceral. Why? It's, because it's, because the... The, person, because, the generation because, building it is not building it for that for themselves, nor are they going to see the fruits of it. No, I understand. I understand. But I think we need to address the reaction and the offing that comes as a consequence of please, a statement like please, that, please. right? You know, one of the differences between the, you know, the traditional, the traditional religious or the traditional sacred canopy that you're describing that was embedded in the ecclesia and this this sort of these these systems of collective intelligence that you're describing in the now mm -hmm. are separated by degrees of acceleration mm -hmm. that are like momentous you know um and the idea that maybe this is the seed for something that will bear its fruits in the far flung future is is one thing that's a it's a remarkably fascinating thing to imagine and it's there's a certain like there's part of me that is enthralled by that make no mistake but i also think that like we need to be very very um attentive to the magnitude of risk that comes oh, as a course. consequence of that displacement like when that wiggles loose mm -hmm. it can careen mm -hmm. and yes. when it careens this is yeah. a powerful like promethean yes. destructive force yes. let's not yes. forget that no, right no, you get the battle of kursk from this i get it yeah yeah i know you get it i know you get it but like i think like we need to like there needs to be there 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 always needs to be that sort of countervailing that countervailing sense of restraint mm -hmm. which i think is a socratic restraint as well as much as it is anything when we face the sort of the 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 when we face the impulse mm -hmm. to be triumphant in the face of I that open without having the tradition that without grounds, having the tradition that grounds it out yeah. and that this and this because you know the traditions that you're talking about right the syncretism of those traditions is something that gathered itself together yes, yes. over a over an enormous amount of time like centuries and centuries and centuries right we spent so much time talking about about the sensing around error and how incremental that process is, right? And this idea that we now have the affordances to scale this in mm -hmm. ways that maybe were never were never available. Mm -hmm. You know, all of the possibility that attends to that, as enthralling as it is, it is just as dangerous. I, I don't disagree, but it's unavoidable. Yes. Okay. That the, so I I don't disagree. Um, but I think the, the power that the acceleration gives us to do in days, what took people years to do is, is not going away. And so we can either let it run at the behest of who it's running for now, the state, the market, or we can try and find a, 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 a way to appropriate it within a project of trying to conduce, right? That whatever we want to call it, I'll just, that, 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 that ecclesia towards the individual and collective cultivation of wisdom. And, 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 and right, the, the thing that we have going for us is we do have the history and, and, and we have to, like, we have to avoid both, I, I keep saying this, we have to avoid both the nostalgia and the utopia because we've learned the deep lessons about how those put us into fundamentalism on one hand or the Promethean endeavor on the other. I totally agree with that. And, but we also like, think about this. This is collapsing privacy and publicity. Mm -hmm. It is collapsing written and speaking. It is collapsing, uh, the, uh, a, a, a time, a, a, a spatial temporal bound conversation and a meta conversation that's taking place in, in conceptual space rather than in like, it's, it's collapsing all of those. And so the, uh, what I, what I, I guess I, I take seriously what you say. So I'm going to try and put this as I hope, and I hope the hope is a rational hope and that's a weird meta hope, but I hope those new powers and the lessons we've learned about nostalgia and utopia mean that we can offer a better choice for how to appropriate the acceleration than the one that is being currently made not for us but without us by the cultural machinery yeah. that's at work right now 
So that's that's my response. And I, and I would say that there's one other thing kind of going for this, right? Is that although this may arrive via technology at people's screens, I don't think this is technology, what we're doing right now. This is not, this is what we're doing right now is not, we're not, this is not increasing technology, this conversation. It's not collapsing distances and making, making of resources. This is, these are these long meandering dialogues, right? That may or may not like make any sense at the end of the day. It, this is not an optimization of something, right? So I think the, that that's what I'm really interested in this of like, I don't, I don't know exactly what to think about it, but it's like that, that we can in some sense bring this on a technological platform, that that technological platform shows something fundamentally untechnological, right? That doesn't lead to just more technology mm-hmm. and makes it available, right? In what we call this court, this corner of on, on the this internet, this little corner of the internet. Yeah, I don't know what to think about all of that, right? Speak, speaking in terms of, which, of but that's that just strikes me. Persigian insight too. It's yeah, a really good Persigian insight. Yeah, I I agree with you. Like I don't think I I I think that there is, I think that there's very very good reason mm-hmm. um, to think that that the technology that the technology doesn't have to be technologizing. Yes, but but but. I mean, I didn't mean my response, and I think this. I want to. I want to, mm-hmm. and add that to what I said to Chris. I didn't want my. I didn't want. Like I wasn't trying to like, re, like, refute you or anything like that, because I take seriously what you said. Like I want. I want to hear more of like, a response. I take very deeply what you said. Like when we very deeply, you know this. I am. When we unmoor this stuff from religion, we face huge dangers but what the two things i'm saying is given technology leaving it more to religion also subjects us to fundamentalist right uh right fundamentalist nostalgia and promethean totalitarian utopias too right and so like like i want to hear more what like i think the risk is i think you are right to 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 speak to give voice to that risk yeah Uh, but i want i i I'm sorry, I'm not giving you anything it's, specific. It's, I just want to. Well, draw I you guess up. it's you know, I, like I mean, if I didn't, if obviously, if I, if I, if I didn't think that there was a gathering, if I, if I didn't think that there was logos in this enterprise, then you know, I wouldn't be sitting here with you. So I think that, but that reminder, that 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 Socratic mm-hmm. doubt, I think, is just has to be a perennial, yes. irrepressible feature of this work. Mm-hmm. Yes. In the way that the uh, that the dialectic and the dialogos corrects the proposal each time it cycles, and yes, the yes. way that the proposal is dissolved and reformed and dissolved and reformed mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. dissolved mm-hmm. and reformed. Okay, yes. That the faith in this has to be ultimately must ground out in a faith in the logos itself, yes. and the mm-hmm. true, the good, and yes. the beautiful. Mm-hmm. Yes. Right. This is yes. a bon- the bonocentric movement, mm-hmm. and if there is a way, and I think that we're committed to the idea of to committed to the project of keeping that at the center always and i think that but the doubt doubt in ourselves doubt in the enterprise and doubt in in doubt such that we remain vigilant to the myriad of unintended motives and consequences and very, very real human frailties and digressions that creep into the best laid plans and the, and the, and the, and the most decent of intentions that just has to remain a feature of this work. Mm-hmm. And I, so yeah, in, in giving it voice in this moment, mm-hmm. what I'm doing is I'm making mm-hmm. sure that it becomes a feature of the very work itself, and, and never... that's what makes it dialectical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I, right. I think you're absolutely right. I, I, I'm glad. And if we I, lose I, that, yeah. then we're guilty of something very severe. Yeah. So then, 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 let me return to my interjection. But I think that was properly what was truly happening when people were building cathedrals. I think you're right. 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 They, mm-hmm. There is the, yeah. the there is yes. the non egocentric commitment to the the true, the good, and the beautiful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so if you'll allow me to put that back into what I was saying, that's, that. I, I think it's, I think I'm being honest when I'm saying, I was trying to also convey that. But I think, but I think this idea of, and you're right, you, and you, you all, you, you call it out, right? Right. And this is, you know, we see this in Socrates and in Kierkegaard, that this, 
this continual reminder of the need to suspect ourselves of being guilty of hubris or despair in ways that we're not understanding or acknowledging and how that can drive us into totalitarianisms in very powerful ways. I think that's really, really powerful. And I hear you, and I, and I hear you even doing this when we were doing the series within the series. I hear you, and this is meant as a compliment, I hear you trying to articulate this new and different non-Cartesian sense of doubt. Hmm. And I think, like, I think, like, hmm. I think there's a deep calling in you to this. And I, I hear you carefully and, and incrementally in the positive sense of the word, coming back to this again and again and again. And I, I just want to afford you the opportunity to maybe take, take another step at it or another stab at it or whatever there is the nonviolent metaphor that's appropriate, right? You, 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 like you, you, you really resonated when I, when I gave that back to you as a proposal, like you're trying to, and I think this is right. I think part of what we're doing here is trying to are not, it's not the only thing we're doing, but a proper corrective part, a proper, a proper normative part of what we're doing here is trying to articulate a non-Cartesian, non-merely skeptical, non-merely cynical notion of doubt that is needed now. And I want to give you, and I'm not, I'm not trying to say, now, Chris, do it, finish it, come on. I'm not doing that. But I want to give you uh, the opportunity to take another step at trying to articulate that. Because that's like, I feel like that's what needs to be heard from you right now, amongst other things. Hmm. But like, it seems to be really landing with you. Like you're trying to articulate, and I, I hear that all through what you and I were doing with Kierkegaard. And I didn't get a chance to bring it out, but this seems perfectly opportune. You're trying, you're like, there's this non-Cartesian, non-postmodern sense of doubt that is needed here. Socratic doubt. Yeah, but 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 that's to name it correctly, yeah. but that's yeah, not to explicate it, it properly, <laughs> right? Is that fair? It's yeah, it's beautiful. Thank you. I I um I really appreciate you seeing it and inviting it and valuing it and seeing it as an essential ingredient in what we're doing. I really totally. appreciate that. And I knew, I knew, I know that's true of you. I know that's true of you. Um, but I appreciate you calling it forth that way. I mm. really, really do. I really do. I think how to explicate it. I, I mean, I don't know. I, 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 we've done so much of that already through the, the series within the series. I mean, to maybe just to put it very simply or to begin to put it very simply, I think you've already done it in a sense that this kind of reflexive suspicion. And that doesn't mean to be self-loathing. And I know yeah. that you're wary, you're wary of regressions or yeah. digressions into self-loathing, and I'm sensitive to that. And that's not really what I mean. It's not affectively what I mean. It's just a recognition of finitude, properly speaking, mm. right? And it is a Socratic self-doubt because it's the recognition that we, each of us in, as individuals and collectively do not comprehensively know ourselves. Mm -hmm. We cannot take comprehensive account of ourselves, mm -hmm. not simply because our perspective of ourselves is finite, but, be, but because we're always changing and unfolding in a Heraclitan way. Yeah, yeah. We can't get a final and exhaustive right. purchase on our capacity to elude our own expectations. And that's why the commitment, the commitment to whatever perspective is supernal to the sum of interests that we have at any one time is a decision we have to make at every single moment. Mm -hmm. And the minute we don't make that decision, we make the opposite. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's really the Kierkegaardian yes. point, right? Yeah. That's the continuance of yeah. the sin or the continuance of faith, is that every single moment that we don't make that decision to renew that commitment to the Logos and to renew the artful and sapiential suspicion toward ourselves, which is also a hope. Yes. In both aspects, uh, always. dialectically. Yeah, always, always. The minute we don't renew that, the minute we don't renew that, we've yeah. lost it. And so yeah. that's a hard thing. Like, it's difficult. Like, uh, what, I'm, what I'm asking of us and myself is something that's very, very difficult to do. Um, but, um, but, but so is the scope. So, I mean, the, the scope of what it is that we're proposing and you're proposing, mm. and I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of beauty and valor um, mm. and wisdom to the proposal and to the project. And I think that in order for it to have a chance, I think it needs to be paired with an equally rigorous commitment 
to that kind of reflective and reflexive scrutiny that cannot yield itself even for a moment. I think you're doing what you, yes, and to us, but I think if you'll allow me, you're also offering another answer to why, why now, why this, why now, which is the advent of uh, this doubt that is most needed, this new kind of doubt that is most needed right now. Can I ask, I think that to bring in another dimension to this doubt that I think is an important part of this. And I, I, I mean this, I feel this personally, I sense this personally in you, but there's something deeper than just the personal around it. There's, there's some kind of grief or sadness about the, the loss of the church, the loss of the, all the institutions. There's some kind of, there's some kind of grief that, that I, I feel, I felt it in this conversation. It's funny as you, as you were talking about this, I, I think I felt it in you and I realized I was feeling it as well. Mm -hmm. That feels important around this. You said this in the car. You have to put a face on grief before you can grieve. Yeah. 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 This is us trying to interface to put a face. Oh, on. so so just the fact, the fact that we're bringing very, you know, yeah, yeah. The, the books, all yeah. of this, it's like that face is there. Yes. That face is there that these things were once implicit, built into the architecture and different in, in, in these ways and the, and the people who have died over it and the traditions and there's a tremendous grief that that's dying and in many cases dead, right? That I think seems part. I think this. that's right too. I think you often, I think we share this, but I, you profoundly, I remember when you did this on, when we were talking with Paul about this, the, the, you, the, the hauntingness of the dying star metaphor you used which was a, a metaphor of grief, profound grief. I think, I think that, that like you are, that, I think, I, I, and I agree, I, I think the two are bound up together. I think part of what the, and why this could be offered to the culture as a whole, part of offering the new kind of doubt is a way of trying to, to face mm. the grieving that is needed mm. properly. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. This, the, this silence that just opened up seems important. I, I think we should just stay in it for a bit. Yeah. I'd like to ask Taylor, who was giving a lot of really pregnant hmms while the three of us were doing that, what was happening for him. <laughs> yeah, could you say that another <laughs> way? <laughs> <laughs> I'm left with... There's something here, like I'm always, so my hmms were me sort of trying to connect to the grief to try to follow the through line that you guys are weaving together. And where I landed just before you spoke was, like it occurs to me that the screams of the grief have been the latching on to these other false religions, mm. the move towards politics, the move towards whatever these other poor replacements for what has been lost and you're not a religious person by no. Any, right? no not at all yeah to church twice i think maybe in my life yeah i know and it's like i can sort of like sense into it a little bit you know if i like take a, a breadth of experience of being with people in like the despair or the anger or the frustration or that the trying to keep it together 
And there's something about this idea of grief as like a through line that runs through all these experiences that turn up the volume on all the unpleasantness that we seem to be seeing. What do you see, what do you think of the proposal I made of Chris's, you know, like exemplification in progress of a new kind of doubt as related to getting us out into what we need to be in, in order to properly face the grief. Yeah. The, so my experience of the, the discussion of the doubt, I went back to something Guy was saying and it's like, well, that's why we practice. Right. We continue to practice so that we, we, we do the asanas so that we turn around and integrate and come into more optimal gripping, you know, more of a responsive state such that we are not going, you know, some part of me is like, we're not going to fall into that. And yet there are still things on the fringe that I think the doubt is very useful for. So that was how it was for me then. And then when I was, you were trying to make like the need for the new doubt. Yeah. Something about that seemed like at first, like really mysterious to me. And then with the grief coming online, it's something about like, you know, a once bitten, twice shy sort of situation where it's just like, I think, I imagine people are aware of their experience of that loss of meaning mm -hmm. of their disconnection from the traditions without a suitable or adequate facsimile or replacement available. And I would be really suspicious, hermeneutics of suspicion, and really hesitant and would want for me to extend trust. I think I would need to see the doubt. I would need to see mm. the self analytical, mm -hmm. uh, accountable movements. It has to be a, a feature of the community, the fellowship, the mm. practice that I'm about to move into, which I think again, speaks to that idea of like moving towards wise practice, wise community. Right. That's what the, exactly. In addition to the, our perennial fallibility towards vice, mm -hmm. there is the historical moment of profound grief that makes us additionally susceptible to self-deception, manipulation, etc. And therefore we need a new kind of doubt beyond the perennial forms or the forms of modernity in order to address this specific dimension that confronts us. Does that land for you? Saying it, that? it does. I mean, I don't think it's new. I might, I might challenge that. Um, I think you mean new in the sense of, you know, new to, new to maybe a great many people, new to. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't mean new to mm -hmm. humanity, but I, I mean new in sort of a post Nietzschean new. Yeah, right. I mean it's. A, I think there's. It's a very. I think the kind of doubt that I, you've you've described it very, very eloquently. Um, and I think that the doubt that you're describing and the doubt that is so necessary is a doubt that has always been an aspect of faith. Yes. 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 I, yes, I, 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 you know. I, yes, I totally acknowledge the perennial aspect, yeah. but I'm trying to get at also something that I think Taylor's putting his finger on that, you know, and, and the guy said, we're, 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 we are in the rain shadow of God, yeah. right? Or at least the traditional theistic and well, the traditional modern theistic, not the traditional classical. It's classical theism and modern, the, modern theism are very different yeah. from each other. Yeah. But we're in the rain shadow of the death of the, like of the classical, uh, sorry, of the modern monotheistic God, right? Yeah. And so I think that brings with it, uh, I mean, and, and Nietzsche had a presentiment of this, like, how can we become worthy of, of it? Course. We need to do festivals, but then he precisely did not tell us how to grieve. Yeah. Right. He did not help us yeah. how, how to grieve. And this is one of my critiques of Heidegger too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I don't see Heidegger properly. He's, he's in, he's, he's doing uh, the death of God, but let, he's not really. Let's look at, let's look at what, what grief kind of is the structure yeah. of grief and, and see, and, and see what this looks like. So I'm going along, I'm in a relationship with you, or I'm involved with something and I've been involved for years and I'm close and I'm, we've, you and I have had bonding experiences and qualities of experience and like while we're friends i have a future of those qualities with you and then you die or you go away or the thing falls apart 
And then there's this whole period where my mind, the mind or the nervous system has it fused, that they're the qualities of life or qualities of being get, are, are fused with that person or that yes. thing, right? Yes. And so when that person suddenly goes away or that thing falls apart, there's this whole period where you lose not just the qualities of being feel like they go with them, right? But also the future of having them. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so that gives, that's what makes grief not sadness, that's, right? That's, that's right. like, that's literally painful. That's agonist. Mm -hmm. And in the, in my understanding is the process of grief, the process of like the denial, the anger, right? The sadness, the grieving, the rage is this process of your nervous system um, basically uncollapsing the image of that person or that, 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 that relationship from their, the experience of being, right? I would, I would tweak it. I think the experience of grief is growing into a kind of person in which those possibilities become available to you again. Yeah. And so that you can pull them apart and so that you can get a future yes. again. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And that the restoration of those qualities yes. again in the future. Yes. And it's, and it's, but that's also how tr grief can be transformative. But you, you, right? you but you can become Mrs. Caversham. Who's that? Great expectations. She was jilted at the altar and she leaves the room. Right. It won't allow it to be changed. Right. And she's like in the oh, perpetually in right. that moment, mm -hmm. walked into the moment of the loss of the beloved. And like, and she's just a collapsed yeah. individual in profound right. way. Right. Mm -hmm. Or then you, or you have the opposite. You, 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 you have Caversham or callous. You just, wow. Yeah. I, I didn't really care. And yeah. then you just keep, right? Yeah. So, right. And so there's something about, and I'm trying, I, I think this is really good. I'm trying to map that on. Yeah. How does that, which I think is what you're proposing. It's yeah. like what Plato does in the Republic. Yeah. How does that map onto our cultural situation? Right. Avoiding those two right. extremes. Is this fair? Yeah, this is fair. Okay. So I'm just, I just wanted to lay that out of, of just th that sense of the restoration of those qualities again in our future. But th when they come into our future, after going through that, they come into our future in a much greater, fuller way. They can. Right? Yes. Like if you really go through the grieving yes. process, yes. right? Yes. Yes. And it's this in the in the process has to do with like how do you how do you go through it? You cry, you 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 sit in the emptiness, you talk about it, you get pissed off, you like but you but rely, it's this process no, of no, like but it's that, but you also rely on ritual. I, we did this with Bruce and Alderman is, and yes. David Pascal, the, the funeral yes. and the wake, like there's and rituals. Tears, yes. And te yes. And crying is a social practice. Yes. Right? Yes. Crying is a social practice. It, I think it comes back to memory again. You have to find a way, we were talking about this before, you have to find a way to participate in the rebirth of the very thing that is lost in such a way that it passes into the eternal. And it passes into the eternal in its loss because of how it becomes part of the new person that you are, yeah, yeah, that yeah. is simply more of yourself, Yes. right? It's like, who am I in the wake of this loss? Who are we all in the wake of this loss? We don't know. But I think the grief has something to do with the commitment to discover precisely that. So we could appropriate grief as a cultural aporia. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And there's something, I would say one of the commonest experiences I have of dialectic in the dialogos is these glimmerings of a sense of the future of what we're dialoguing about being deeply in my future. Right. Right. That sense of the eternal. Right. And that, that starts to light itself up. Right. There's so th I would almost say like these, the actual ritual of this process, whether or not we actually, f it feels like where we talk about grieving or if any of that stuff's explicit, right. The, this very process, really interesting to, th to look at this as the process of some kind of grief. Mm -hmm. I've never really looked at it like that, but I can start to see something like that now. Well, we're going to have to draw this series to a close and perhaps it's going to leave me in a bit of grief. Um, but, um, 
I, before I say the final word, I'd like to give each one of you any, whatever you wish. It could be responsive, uh, provocative, or it could be summative, but each one of you an opportunity to just say what is called to your mind and heart right now as we're bringing the series to a close. Maybe we'll start with Chris. Sure. Well, first of all, thank you. I mean, it's been it a very... It's funny, it's, it's a, to me, it's been a very instance of following the Logos because I don't think I had a real idea of what it is that I was participating in mm -hmm. until we came to be in the throes of it, right? Until it actually unfolded. Um, I, trusted in its, I trusted in the idea and possibility of it, but that's just my trust for you. That was easy to come by. But it remained very mysterious in its in in what it contained, and um, and it's a beautiful it, it's be, it's a beautiful example to me that we you know we enter into something not knowing what it is mm -hmm. and who we are in it and what it means to us and what we mean to it right we just we have an inkling that it's worthwhile before we understand why it's worthwhile. And that's the very way a dialogue or a dialectic and the dialogos begins. And um, so to me, it, the, the, journey of, the, the journey undertaken exemplified its purpose and its character. And, um, and it was just a real joy, a real joy. Thank you. Very well. I just got flooded with images and memories and emotional memories of two people. My grandfather and, and Jerry Candelaria, the guy that I co-discovered circling with. And I'm just, it's so interesting. I'm just flashing back to just these particular, basically Dialogos moments, mm. right? Of we. We, we called it aspecting, right? When, when it was just Jerry and I going off to the beach, staying up all night, having the, kind of these kind of, kind of conversations. And I just had this moment of where both of them like, in fact, I just looked at Boober's eyes and it reminded me of kind of Jerry's <laughs> face somehow. And I just had this sense of just, I, they just winked at me. And I, that just means a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Hmm. I like that. Yeah, feel sweet. Uh, I'm just so grateful to be a part of this. Like, thank you. I really appreciate this series. I, I think I've said to you, I see it as a call to action, yeah. and uh, I just love that. It, it's I'm I'm a bit of a rubber meets the road kind of person, so I love that you've built this and filled in my gaps in knowing as well. I think it's going to make me and has made me a better uh, facilitator and leader and course designer so internal gratitude for that and for you guys it's just a blast to uh like hang out and have conversations and i just had this thought you know so i think this is a saying that something that you said before you know something about like the essence of circling of sort of like a, or something about like what marks a good circle is like um coming out of it seeing the world just a little bit differently and I just sort of realized in this moment, like, oh, that's actually not also unique to circling. Okay. This is also happening in this conversation. There's like something has opened up. So it's, we're not just talking. Like I am now changed. Mm -hmm. I will now be looking through my experience of, of culture and society. And I will be looking and checking, like, what are the signs of grief that are there? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's just a great testament to what it is that we're doing here. Um, so yeah, thank you. So I want to again, repeat my deep appreciation, gratitude for all of you and, and Chris for the series within the series and for the amazing crew and all the people working behind the scenes. Um, and for all the people that have preceded this series and from, you know, from Socrates to Nicholas of Cusa to Buber to Kierkegaard, right? And, and, and intense gratitude. Uh, and then 
this is a bit of a preposterous compare preposterous comparison. So I asked for charity from everybody. But Handel said when he wrote the Messiah, he felt as if heaven had opened and he had seen the face of Christ. I think, and I'm not saying I compose this the way Handel composed the Messiah, but being able to participate in this is something opened for me. And I was able to see the depths of the Socratic way that I could never have realized on my own. Something shone forth. And, um, um, and it's something that I feel accountable to and accountable for. Um, and I'm very appreciative of the way you all embodied it and enfleshed it and just made, gave it, gave it a face, um, so that we could look deeply into the eyes of what is being offered and what is possible for us. So I want to thank you all. I want to thank everybody here. And for the last time for this series, I want to thank you very all, all of you very much for your time and attention.